Okay, so this is about uh, chapter 17, the radioactivity and the nuclear chemistry. And uh, in this chapter, we are going to briefly study the nuclear reactions uh, for some of those uh, radioactive, radioactivity. So the radioactivity is the emission of a tiny energetic particles uh, by the nuclei of a certain unstable atoms. Here is a picture, uh, a cartoon picture of an atom. So there is a nucleus. Uh, the nucleus, some of those atoms, they are not stable. They will emit some of those particles. So the particle can be the electron or can be something else. The radioactivity is the emission of this particle by the nuclear eye of some atom. And uh, we are going to study different type of uh, radioactivity. First, the history, the discovery of radioactivity so about in the beginning of uh, 20th century, 1903. Uh, so the, in those time, and uh, for example, the Curie uh, received the Nobel Prize in physics, uh, which uh, she here uh, she share with the Bakir and her husband uh, Pierre Curie for the discovery of radioactivity. And in 1911. Curie was awarded a second uh, Nobel Prize, this time in chemistry, for the discovery of the two new elements, uh, plutonium and lithium. Uh, so this is the picture of uh, uh, Maria Curie and uh, her two daughters. The element uh, 96 uh, curium is named in honor of uh, Maria Curie and her contributions to our understanding of radioactivity. Uh, so Maria Curie with her two daughters, uh, Irene on the right, become also a distinguished uh, nuclear physicist uh, in her own right, winning a Nobel Prize in 1935. And Abe uh, left, uh, wrote a highly acclaimed uh, biography of her mother. Depend on the particle emitted from the nucleus. So we have those uh, common type of radioactivities, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma decay. Um, while Curie focused her work on discovering the different kinds of radioactivity elements, uh, Ernst um, Rutherford and others focused on characterizing the radioactivity itself. Uh, those scientists found that the emission was produced by the nuclear eye of radioactive atoms. The radioactive nuclear eye were unstable and were emit a small piece of uh, themselves in the form of electromagnetic radiation to gain stability. Uh, so these were the particles that the bacteria and the Curie detected. The type of radiation, uh, there are several types um, commonly in this chapter we are going to study the alpha ray, beta ray, and gamma ray, and the positrons. So the nuclei are unstable when they are too large or contain an unbalanced ratio of neutrons to protons. Smaller nuclei need about one neutron to every one proton to be stable, while larger nuclei need about 1.5 neutrons to every proton. Uh, the isotope, isotope notation, uh, we call that isotopes are atoms of an element with a different number of neutrons. Any isotope can be represented with the following notation. In this notation, uh, you can see this X here will be the chemical element. So therefore, this X can be carbon, nitrogen, uranium, plutonium, and so on. Uh, the A, this will be a number, will be an integer number. It is uh, a mass number. Uh, we will talk about that later. The Z is the, the atomic number. That is really the number identify the chemical element. Um, so the, the Z number is also the number of a proton and also called the atomic number. You can get those information from the periodic table. 
so this mass number will be the number of proton plus number of neutrons. The main subatomic particles are those. Uh, so proton, neutron, electrons. And themselves can be represented by the same mirror notation. Proton will be P11, neutron will be N01, electron will be E910. Uh, for example, the alpha radiation will be the alpha particle ejected from the nuclei, initially there's a larger nuclei or an unstable nuclei. So then um, the, the alpha particle will be the nucleus of a helium atom which uh, consists of uh, two, uh, the, in this picture, the two like a gray and two red. Uh, so the two gray may be two neutrons, the two red may be two protons. So that's called the alpha particle. Uh, so once we take that out, then whatever left over is the daughter nuclei. Uh, the term nuclei that we referred in this chapter is mean a specific isotope. Uh, the original atom is called the parent nuclei. The product is called uh, the daughter nuclei. The nuclear equation represents the changes that occur during radioactivity and other nuclear processes. The nuclear equation for the alpha decay of uranium 238 is as follows. We see the in this equation there's only one reactant and two product. Uh, this product we will call a small particle. So this is the other product and the other products are relatively larger for the daughter nuclei. Parent nuclei is referring to the reactant. In nuclear chemistry, we are mainly interested in changes within the nucleus. Therefore, the two plus charge that were ultimately derived for the Helium nucleus is omitted uh, for the alpha particle. When an element emits an alpha particle, the number of uh, protons in its nuclear chain transforming the initial element into a different element. In chemical reactions, elements retain their identity in a nuclear reaction. However, elements often change their identity as a result of a change in the number of uh, protons in the nucleus. Uh, so therefore, we must balance uh, the nuclear equation in a different way. The sum of a common number on both sides of a nuclear equation must be equal. The sum of the mass number on both sides must also be equal. So therefore, we have uh, this example we saw before. The number 238 is the mass number on the left. 234 is the one mass number. The other mass number is the four. So therefore, we can see the uh, that number are, are balanced, 238, left side, right side, 234 plus 4, 238. Then the lower number, 92, is the, the atomic number. So 92 on the left and 90 plus 2 is also on the right. So that's also balanced. <clears throat> we can deduce the mass number and the atomic number of unknown daughter nuclei because the equation must be balanced. By balancing the atomic number on both sides of the nuclear equation and the mass number on both sides of the equation. Yeah, and here's another example. We have the parent in the nuclei with the sodium uh, 232. And we see this process is also the alpha decay, so that will produce this helium 24. Uh, by balancing the Atomic number, we will figure out this y will be 88 uh, because on the right we have y plus, y plus 2 is for the atomic number, on the left is 90, therefore y plus 2 equals 90. If solving this equation, uh, subtract the 2 on both sides, we get y equal to 88. Uh, and then we see the mass number on the top. So on the top, uh, the mass number on the left. Of this arrow is 232. So therefore, we see 232 equals x here plus 4 here. And we solve in this equation for x, we get x equal to 228. Therefore, we have this information so far. We see the mass number for the daughter nuclei is 228. Uh, then the atomic number is 88. 
Once we know the atomic number is 88, we go to the periodic table, we see who is number 88. And then number 98 uh, from the table is radian or R8. So therefore we finish this question by rewrite that uh, what is unknown, the unknown becomes radian 228. Another type of uh, decay or radiation is the beta radiation. So the beta radiation occurs when an unstable nucleus emit an electron. As the emission occurs, a neutron turns into a, a proton. What this in red means um, uh, means where the electron comes from. We know in the nucleus, initially the, the nucleus only have proton and a neutron. So we don't have an electron. So where the electron come from? It comes from a neutron turn into a proton. The other type, uh, the, the beta particle will be uh, a high energy electron. We sometimes use like this notation. Elect e is for electrons, so negative one is for the atomic number, zero is for the mass number, which means uh, we don't have a proton or neutron in the electron. Um, so this negative one tell you the atomic number is negative one for the electron. It kind of tell you the charge uh, for electron. Uh, so when an atom emit a, a beta particle, uh, a neutron turn into a proton. So that tells where the electron come from. Uh, you come from the nucleus, but in the nuclear we don't have an electron, so we can say. Uh, a neutron turn into a proton in the same time produce an electron. So the, the equation for the beta uh, decay will be uh, the smaller particle will be an electron. And then we still have the parent uh, nuclide and uh, daughter nuclide uh, balance the number 88 equals 89 minus 1 and 228 equals 228 plus 0. So therefore, we see this equation is a uh, valid equation, the good equation. And uh, another type of radiation is the gamma radiation. So it is different from uh, alpha and beta radiation. Gamma radiation is not uh, matter, uh, or the gamma particle is not a matter. It's uh, actually a high energy electromagnetic radiation or called the photons. So gamma ray are high energy, short wavelengths of photons. And they, the simple for the gamma ray is as follows. We have this Greek letter gamma, then there are two number. The top number, again, will be the mass number. The bottom number is the atomic number. And both of them is zero because we don't have a charge for the electromagnetic radiation, we don't have a neutron proton in those kind of uh, waves. So therefore, um, we see these three um, type of radiation uh, so far. And um, the gamma radiation usually do not uh, occur by itself. It's usually accompany some other uh, decays, uh, maybe a alpha decay, or beta decay, uh, so therefore we can write a new equation for the previous uh, alpha decay for the uranium-238. So in addition to the typical daughter nuclide, the small particle, helium particle, now we have a new particle, which is really some energy emitted. Uh, so then the last uh, emission we are gonna start in this chapter will be the positron emission. So the positron, sometimes uh, we, we call that an anti-electron. It's uh, very similar in some sense as electron, but the charge is opposite. So electron has a negative one charge, positron has positive one charge. And uh, so here is the picture show uh, where, uh, what happened when the positron emission. Uh, so when the positron emission, what really happened in the nucleus is the proton turn into a neutron, then plus the positron. So once there's a positron in the nucleus, it has no place to stay, just 
uh, just uh, flying out. Uh, so the sample for the polytron in a nuclear equation is as uh, follows. Uh, because it's very similar as electrons, so therefore we still use E. Uh, for electrons, so here will be negative one, but for the positron, so here is a positive one. Zero is again the mass number, so we don't have a neutron, proton, yin, and positron, so therefore the mass number is zero. Uh, so the plus one just tells us uh, so for the positron, the charge. Is a plus one, or you can see atomic number is a plus one, but that doesn't make too much sense. Atomic number plus one it should be like uh, hydrogen, but not that is not. Um, so, therefore, when an atom emit a uh, positron, its atomic number decreased by one because now uh, we have a fewer proton. Proton turn into a neutron, and uh, the, pro the positron, positron is ejected. Uh, one example of positron emission equation is uh, fast ferrous 30 uh, produce uh, silicon 30. Uh, then, in the same time, uh, because silicon has like an atomic number one lower than the fast ferrous, so that means it uh, produces a positron. And uh, you can check the number again. The bottom number is uh, band length, the top number is band length. So the different radiation have a different uh, penetration power, damaging power. Uh, the damaging power depends on kind of uh, their ionization power and the penetration power. Uh, to ionize means to create ions. Uh, so they are charged particles. Uh, if radiation ionize molecular, which means when they come in tech, uh, contact with uh, the molecules in the cells, they can make those molecules like become uh, uh, ions, and that can be uh, very uh, damaging to the cells. Uh, so therefore, we want to see uh, what are their power to ionize some molecules. Uh, what are their power to get into the cells for the penetration power? So the alpha radiation is the kind of the, the bigger, bigger, bigger guy, a lot of particles. It's kind of a semi truck of uh, radioactivity. So therefore it is the most massive of all the uh, radiations. Alpha radiation has the most uh, potential to interact with and damage other molecules, including biological one. Of all type of radioactivity, alpha radiation has the highest ionization power. Um, because of its large size, alpha particle has the lowest penetration. That means the ability to penetrating something is relatively low. Um, I don't know whether this analogy is a good analogy. The semi try to try to get us through a traffic, which means the obey the traffic uh, traffic law. Otherwise, the semi truck can get into get us through a traffic kind of easy. But um, so whatever, so just memorize. They have the highest uh, ionization power and uh, have the lowest penetration power. So therefore, the alpha radiation does not easily penetrating cells. It can be stopped by a sheet of paper by clothes or even by air or by your skin. A lower level alpha emitter keep all side body is relatively safe. But if the alpha emitter is ejected or, or inhaled from like a, <clears throat> from a food eating or, or breathing, it can become very dangerous because the alpha particle, once it gets inside the body, there is not too much uh, something to block in them. So they can penetrate in, even though they have a lower penetrating power, but uh, to penetrate in like a cell membrane, probably not that difficult, therefore can be very damaging. The beta particle radiation, and uh, uh, so they kind of like a mid-size car, uh, their ionization is not uh, too high. 
uh, but in the same time, their penetration power is not too low. Uh, so therefore, like uh, to block in the beta particle, only the air or the closing or a piece of paper is not enough. Um, so consequently, a low level beta emitter outside the body possess a high risk than alpha emitter. Inside the body, however, the beta emitter does not uh, do that much damage as compared to alpha emitters. Uh, the last one uh, will be the gamma rays. So the gamma are the kind of a motor bike of radioactivities. Uh, so the uh, the ion, ionization power means if they hit on something, they were not that much damaging, but they are highly penetrating. So therefore, um, they can go through like the tissues, uh, muscles, uh, uh, and the clothes, even bones, uh, but they get into the cells, they are not that much of uh, uh, bad, but because they are penetrating so, so strong, so therefore there may be like a lot of gamma radiation getting inside someone and that will be damaging. To, uh, so to summarize, uh, we see alpha particle composed of uh, two protons and two neutrons, and it has higher ionization power, but uh, lower penetration power the beta particle are electron emitted from atomic nuclei when a, when a neutron chain into a proton. Beta particle have an intermediate ionization power and also have an intermediate penetrating power. Positron is very similar as um, the beta uh, as electron in terms of the ionization and the penetrating powers. The gamma ray are electromagnetic radiation. They are high energy, short wavelengths of photons. Uh, they have a lowest ionization power, but has the highest penetration power. So you have to balance those. So this table summarizes that uh, four common decays alpha is the first row, beta, second row, gamma radiation and then uh, positron emissions. And here are some of those examples of those radioactive nucleus that goes through those alpha or beta or gamma or the positron emissions. To detecting the radioactivity, one way is using the film badge uh, uh, dosimeters. So in that badge, some material will absorb some of those uh, radioactive uh, radiations, and uh, then frequently you can measure how much radiation absorbed by the badge, and uh, the badge is, is, is carried by some person, then we can tell if that person has been exposed to the radiations. <clears throat> Another very common one you can saw or see, you already see in the movie, so it's just called the Geiger counter, and uh, some people holding those instruments and uh, and you might hear the beeper uh, of the counter. So if there's a higher radiation, the beeper will be, uh, the beeping frequency will be higher, the, the sound intensity will be higher. Uh, so what uh, the operation principle is this tell you here. So there's a chamber in this detector or in the sensor. And uh, in, the, in, the, in this chamber, there are some of those argon, the normal gas argon atom. When the argon atom is exposed to the radiation, so the argon atom chain into ions. So then the ion, uh, we can collect in how much ion are produced and then uh, turn that into electrical current. And then we will see the electrical signal uh, can be the reading, can be the audible clickers. All right. So the the naturally occurring radioactive element in our environment are all under radioactive decay. They are present in our environment because they have very long half life. Some of them like billions of years. 
So they they are like continuously being formed by other also by other process in the environment. One reason for the radioactivity in our environment is the instability of all atomic and nuclei beyond the atomic number like larger than 83. 83 is bismuth. Uh, some isotopes of element with fewer than 83 proton are also unstable and radioactive. The ground beneath you and uh, the food you eat contain a residue numbers of radioactive atoms that enter into your body, fluid and tissues. Small amount of radiation from space made it away through our atmosphere and constantly bombarded the Earth. Human and other living organism has been involved in this environment and adapted to those radiations. Um, so the the radiation of those uh, some unstable nuclei, they have a different uh, um, so-called uh, rate. Uh, the rate can be measured by the half-life, which is the time it takes for half of the parent nuclei in a radioactive example to decay to the daughter nuclei. So that amount of time is called half-life. Uh, because the, the, the decay kinetic of uh, uh, unstable nuclei is the first order. So therefore the half-life is independent how much material we have. We just say to reduce given amount of uh, radioactive material by half, it will take uh, the half-life. Uh, so you can always uh, divide something by half and a half by 22. So each time you divide by two is one half-life. Then you can see how much half life in order to get uh, from the given to some lower level of something left over. So you really can use in this formula see the amount of remaining after the n half life will be one divided by two to the nth power. And here is a picture like we starting, for example, 10 nuclei, and it will take like half life to reduce. To half, which will be five. Uh, um, so then you can reduce from there to two and a half, and so on. So each time uh, you will use one half life, no matter you starting from from ten, uh, from ten to five will be the half life, which is about in this picture about uh, thirteen uh, some. Billion years, and then you go from like five to two point five, you will need another thirteen billion years. Or oh, here, fourteen billion years. Yeah, so that is uh, uh, one example of a half life. Uh, so that is for sodium two thirty two has a half life fourteen billion years, which means if you have one million. Of sodium 232 atom, it will take uh, 14 billion years to reduce to half a million. And then from half a million to quarter million, it will take another 14 billion years. And uh, so the, the how long is the half life depend on the element or the nuclei? The radon 220 has a half life only about one minute. Which means uh, if you have one million read on to 20 atom, and uh, in just about one minute, the number already reduced to half a million. If uh, after another minute, it will reduce to quarter of a million. And this table show you like a different uh, radioactive nuclei and uh, what are their half life and what uh, are their decay mode. Alpha, alpha, beta, alpha, and alpha. So some of them like billions of years, and some of them just a few seconds. We can use uh, the when we talk about the half life to estimate like uh, how long it take for something to decay to some lower level. For example, here we have one point eight moles of example of sodium two twenty. And uh, we see how long it will take uh, from 
to decay from 1.8 to 0 0.225 if the half-life is 1.9 years. Uh, you can use formula or you can just uh, make a table. Uh, so er after every 1.9 years, you will reduce uh, the initial to half. So therefore, we can make this table. Initially, we have 1.8. And uh, one half life, it will reduce to 1.8 divided by 2, or 0 0.9. So how long it take? Taking one half life. One half life is how long? For that, is 1.9 years. So you can, then you can take, uh, or you can go from 0 0.9 to uh, 0 0.45. But this, like, uh, you take a 0 0.9 divided by 2, you get 0 0.45. So that means you take another half life. And uh, so therefore, you go from 1.9 to 3.8. Uh, so then similarly, if you want to see that decrease from 0 0.45 to 0 0.225, so that will take another 1.9 year. So that's how you use a table. And uh, we have these two number 1.8 is the beginning. So after like three half life, we get 0 0.225. So therefore we see it will just take a 5.7 year altogether for 1.8 more to decay to 0 0.225 more. And uh, <clears throat> so some of those uh, natural radioactive decay uh, it will not stop at one uh, product. So it will like uh, going like from one product to another product, finally go to a stable one. Uh, a typical example is the uranium-238. So that is, uh, it will decay like with many, many steps. The first step will be uranium uh, go uh, using like the alpha decay convert into sodium-234. Uh, the half life is about 4.47 billion years. After that, so the solar M234 is not also not stable. It will emit beta particles. And uh, that's pretty much very quick. Uh, so the half life 24.1 days. And uh, it'll produce like a PA234. That is also not stable. And then it'll go to another decay beta decay, but that time the half life is relatively much, much longer than sodium-234 decay. So therefore we can see like, um, it will keep going like that until it get to most relatively stable, not, not the most stable, like the lead, lead two six. So therefore if, uh, we have some uh, like a natural occurring rocks. Uh, in the rock, we can detect uh, we have lead and also uranium. And then we can use this information to calculate uh, like uh, what is the age of the rock. Okay, so this is the picture show the few series or steps of the decay of uranium, the red one. Uh, all the way to the green, the letter two six. Um, so the, the those radioactivity is very common in the environment. For example, the radon, which is a radioactive gas, is one of the product of the natural radioactive decay series of uranium. Uh, whenever there's a uranium in the ground, there's likely to be radon seeping into the air. If the gas is trapped uh, in a dwelling enclosure, radon and its daughter nuclei can attack the dust, uh, attach to the dust particles, and then be inhaled into the lungs, where they can decay radioactively and increase lung cancer risk. The radioactive decay of radon is by far the single the greatest source of human radiation exposure. Radon 222 has a half life of 3.8 days. We can use uh, the half life and uh, to figure out uh, some of those 
like the samples from those artifacts, maybe a piece of earth work or a piece of a human bone. And uh, we can figure out what is the age of that something by using uh, the so-called radiocarbon dating. Uh, so what that means is that you measure uh, the radioactivity of one isotope of carbon called carbon-14. Uh, so carbon-14 is radioactive. It is uh, in the environment and uh, it always produces from nitrogen. And uh, so therefore, for many, many years, like billions and billions of years, the carbon-14 the, on the surface of Earth, pretty much same amount, or the concentration of carbon-14 on the same. Uh, so therefore, we can measure like how many uh, carbon-14 in some of those examples to figure out what is the age of the sample. All right, so here are the equation. So how the carbon-14 is produced in the upper atmosphere from nitrogen. Um, so therefore, uh, we have a, a constant concentration of carbon in the air for a long, long time. And uh, like a billion years ago, or thousands, thousands, uh, 100,000 years ago, we have the concentration of carbon-14. And when the something like the living organism, human, plant, trees, dinosaurs, when they live, they keep like taking in the carbon-14 together with some other carbon element, uh, isotopes. So therefore, uh, we know like, uh, uh, we can compare that with uh, the, the, the level of uh, living organism of carbon-14 for right now, because we see the carbon-14 concentration uh, like this days today is the same as the carbon-14 concentration like a billion years ago. Uh, but when the organism dies, so they stop taking the carbon-14 or anything carbon. So the carbon-12 is still the same, but carbon-14 will decay, become less and less. If we can measure how much uh, uh, carbon like a, uh, 14 level over in the sample, we can estimate what the age of these examples. Uh, you can do that by using formulas, or, or you can just make a table for every like one half life. Uh, you will see like the age of something is 5,715 5, years. So here's the table. Uh, we, let's see, we're assuming we have 100% of carbon-14 uh, when that something is living. Um, so then if we, we measure like a carbon-14 in some example, compared to the carbon-14 level for the living organism, it's only 50. Then we know that's something already dead for like one half life which means 5,715 years. And then you can continue to see if you measure the carbon-14 content in the sample is only 25 compared to the living organism, 100. That means that's something already dead for two half life or uh, 5,715 times two. So that's how you figure out the age of some of those examples, maybe a human skull, human bone, or maybe a piece of a tree or wood. And in this example, so the uh, see there's a skull, probably a very human beings. So then how really is that? Uh, they measure the carbon-14 content compared to the living organism right now is compared to that is only about 3.125%. Which means the living organism has 100, then that scar has only 3.125. So then you go to the table, you can see like 100, 50, 25, 12.5, each time just reduced by, uh, or divided by two. And then we keep adding the half life. So therefore, we can see you will use this much of half life, we go all the way to 3.125. 
which means we're starting with 100, then the age is 28,575. So, so therefore, this is the end of this this uh, chapter.